Today's episode is brought to you by the Bose S1 Pro Multi-Position PA System and WestFloridaRealEstate.com. Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar. Welcome it's a brand new Monday, although it's not Monday when you're listening to this, probably. I'm with a really cool cat, originally from New York City. Oh, no, originally from D.C., but he's got a New York City vibe, so he's like, I consider him one of my homies. Uh, with Carl Burnett, a lot of you guys know him from True Fire and his teaching videos and uh, 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 television compositions. A uh, couple of quick messages. Number one, shout out to, like, the coolest human being on earth, Reggie Hamilton, and badass bass for uh, hooking Carl and I up. Uh, second. Go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash subscribe and you can subscribe to the channel on uh, podcasts and our YouTube channel. And also, if uh, you have access to Carlos Santana or Joe Walsh, I'd really like those guys on the show. So hook a brother up and forward him my way. Carl Burnett, first big influence was working with the amazing, amazing Bill Withers. Um, Bill taught Carl to play the song and always stay in the groove, which he's a very funky dude, so he knows about groove. He also toured the world in Branford, Marsalis's band, Buckshot LaFont, very cool band. There were no, you guys did, it was, that was such a collective, man. No, yeah, no musical boundaries at all. Uh, Branford just told Carl to be yourself, and he gave him a lot of freedom that uh, allowed him to do his own thing as a musician. In addition to playing guitar, he's also done a lot of work on production, including producing Larry Carlton's Grammy-nominated recording, Deep Into It. What does that refer to? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I wasn't involved with the title. Of the I'm just thinking there. What the hell? Uh, Deep title Into the Groove. Oh, okay, of course. Yeah. Yeah, my mind. Title track, along with the single "Morning Magic," included Carl's production and writing, to which Larry then added his impeccable sense of melody and phrasing. And Carl's sound can also be found with multi-award-winning jazz artist Boney James. He's done TV underscores on shows like Extra, TMZ, Pawn Stars—that's P A W N—and Teen Titans Go, which I remember my kids used to watch. That man, yes, it's a cool show, dude. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you coming on the show. Right on. Thanks for having me. You, you bet, man. You went to Michigan State and Berkeley? That's correct. Tell me about that, man. Well, the, the, the crazy thing about ending up at, at Michigan State is that that was my dad's, that's where my dad had graduated. Oh, man, that's really cool. Yeah, so, you know, at that time, I was, when I had applied to schools, there were a couple of others that, that were going to require me to go to summer school, one of which was MIT, because I was thinking I was going to go into a, like an engineering kind of a background, you know. And, uh, and at MIT, I was going to have to go to summer school to take another course for the summer to get in. I'm like, oh, I don't really want to do that. And I'm like, well, Michigan State says I'm in, so I'm going to go to Michigan. So, <laughs> so you're an unusual great. cat. So you got left and right brains going because engineering is extremely analytical. Yeah, well, my plan at that time was to get into electrical engineering. And then the thing that was interesting about ending up at Michigan State that first year of school, that's kind of what shaped my path into, you know, into, into uh, you know, into ending up at Berkeley after that first year. So it was... Um, How's that? It, it, it was important that I, that, I, that I was there. And the interesting thing about being there is that that was the first year that that Magic Johnson was on the Lakers. So, because he, he had played Michigan State before then. Mm -hmm. And I had a t-shirt that was a Michigan State t-shirt that said, all the way with Magic J. That's cool, man. And probably if I still had that today, it, it might be worth a you know. That'd, that'd be an, e that'd <laughs> be an the, eBay the sale. It's a yeah, so weekend away for you and the wife, yeah. Right, you know. But, uh, yeah, when I was at... at at Michigan State, what happened when I was there, um, uh, you know, I got involved with music, uh, you know, as a as an on-campus uh, DJ, and then in addition, you know, some of the other guys that were my neighbors on the floor with their big jazz hands and were listening to a lot of albums and things like this, and then I also uh, j uh, joined an on-campus group called Showcase Jazz, which was, they were promoted concerts uh, on the campus. And I was, uh, I worked uh, for, with them as, as a stagehand. So I, then I, be, you know, got experience from you know, lots of, you know, the acts that were coming through the school and things like this. And then, you know, I just kind of kept feeling like the, the, 
the music was pulling me more than the, going for the straight engineering background. And my attention was kind of thinking I wanted to go into recording engineering and kind of, I guess, you know, not really knowing at that time that, well, maybe I don't need to go into electrical engineering. I, that does, that's not really connected in that way. And then the other thing that I started to get into when I was at Michigan is I took an acoustics course for two semesters. So that was all about the science of sound. And I started, you know, and I was like, wait, you know, maybe I'm going to find a school next year that has a, re a recording program. And, and at that time, that wasn't as, as popular like, like it is, you know, now, you know, so there were only a few schools that even had recording of any kind. I think Miami at that time did. Right. And, um, and, and that's kind of how I ended up at Berkeley. I, wow, it looks like they have a really cool recording program. And, and, then, it, and then it was kind of, well, how am I going to get into Berkeley? And then I thought, oh, wow, I played guitar. I mean, so guitar was really just, was not my focus at that point. It was really about recording and, and wanting to be a recording engineer and things like this. So um, that was what my path was. And then once I ended up at Berkeley, you know, uh, and in, in the music and production program, you know, then, you know, I found that uh, people actually liked the, how I played the guitar. <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> Imagine that. But that was really not, that was not my focus at all when I, when I, when I started out there. Like I said, you know, just the, playing guitar was just a means to get into the recording. And then the other thing about going into Berkeley after that first year at Michigan, was that since I had those college credits, I wanted to be able to, to you know, actually get a, you know, finish school and get and get a degree, you know, and and at that time, that was Berkeley was really the only place where 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 it was possible to do that, you know. Right. Yeah. Um, how did your were your folks supportive of that? Um. Yeah. Absolutely. They they were they were a big support. You know, there their thing was, you know, we don't care what you do, but you got to do something. And, uh, and their support, you know, with me through those college years, you know, was, you know, really important. Uh, otherwise it, it wouldn't have been possible. Yeah. Was your dad an engineer? Is that what? Uh, no, my dad was, he was, uh, uh, in, uh, city, city planning, you know, that's mm. what his background was. And uh, he worked, uh, you know, for the national park service in DC and, um, and yeah, so no, they weren't in 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 the music or or in in that creative field like that at all. No. Interesting. Yeah. That must have been cool though to go to a school where your dad went. I mean, I'd imagine you guys are close. You don't make a decision like that. Oh yeah, yeah. You, your dad, pretty, yeah. Pretty close. You know, and that that was just such a different time. I mean, he when he went to Michigan State, that was, you know, uh, I mean, he finished high school and then he went off to World War II. Holy shit. And then, when he, and then when he came back, he went to Michigan State. Wow. Man, that's yeah. intense. How long was he away for? You know, it, when I think about that, I, I remember, you know, read through your questions, you know, like, and that was like one of the things that really hit me. It's like when you're a kid, you know, some of those deeper things about your parents that you may, that now, I, like my dad passed away since a long time now. So oh, wow, I be back there now and talk to him about, man, what was it really like when you were over in Marseille? Yeah. You know, as a teenager, I mean, he was like seven, yeah. he just finished uh, high school, like 17, you know, 18 years old, you know? Um, yeah, that's amazing. You know, I have a shot of him, you know, got eight by 10 with him and, and some of the guys back then. But yeah, I, I mean, who can say what that was like? Yeah. Yeah. Man, it's kind of sad. I saw this thing on one of the social media channels. It said like our parents and they had a picture of a guy like your dad, 20 yeah. years old, storming the beaches or something. And, yeah, then had a picture, and then it said our kids and it had a picture of somebody the same age with like, I don't know, some on Snapchat with goofy ears or something. And it was like, you know, <laughs> you not to sound like a, an old man, but you're like, uh, who's probably better suited to run the world? <laughs> right. <laughs> Not the guy on Snapchat with a glass. I mean, I hate to say that, but you know, right. um, that's really cool, man. Yeah. That's, that's props to your dad. Oh, and it, and it being veterans day, man. Oh, and, it, and it is veterans. Day. Yeah. That's nice, man. 
So how did, after you got out of Berkeley, how'd you get started in the, in the music business and what was your first big break? I want to talk to you about the Bose S1, which is an amazing speaker for acoustic guitar gigs that I recently got to test drive. The S1 has two separate channels. It's got one for guitar and one for microphone. And there's a third channel you can use for a looper or for backing tracks that you can access by Bluetooth or through a 1 8 inch input. And the S1 is actually portable and rechargeable for up to 11 hours. So the guitar and mic channels, they have separate independent tone, volume, and reverb controls. And they also have some something called a proprietary tone match switch, which EQs, optimizes, and restores the natural sound of your acoustic guitar, which as you know, is typically your biggest problem when you're playing acoustic amps. I tested the S1 speaker and it's very responsive to pickups and the tone, volume, and reverb controls genuinely work great. You can position the S1 four different ways. You can tilt it back to broadcast out to an audience, or you can put it horizontally, vertically, or on a stand. The S1 also has a proprietary Bose accelerometer, which automatically adjusts the EQ and optimizes the sound based on whichever one of these four positions you're using. So effectively, you have an acoustic guitar amp, a PA, and a killer Bluetooth speaker all in one. So the bottom line is, if you're an acoustic player, there's absolutely nothing out there that sounds this good and this big, that's portable and battery powered. And the S1 also happens to be the best Bluetooth speaker Bose makes, which says a lot. I used it myself for a party we had here one night, and it was absolutely amazing. All my kids were freaking out. It's like having a full stereo system out on your patio. You can easily use this for DJing, tailgating, or whatever you want. Before this, you'd have to to spend thousands of dollars on a bunch of equipment to get the same thing the S1 does. On top of that, it's sleek and it looks great, just like all Bose devices do. And besides whatever money back guarantee you get from wherever you buy the S1, Bose also warranties the S1 for two years from any kind of defects in materials or performance. For more information and to find out where to get your own S1, I'd like you to go to pro.bose.com forward slash podcast. Check it out at pro dot bose dot com forward slash podcast and get the s1 it's outstanding this is an important announcement for anyone who wants to advertise here on everyone loves guitar over the last nine months alone we've had 425,000 more downloads added over 25,000 monthly listens and grown our youtube subscriber base by 72 times during this time we've kept our advertising rates consistent but we will be increasing rates on January 1st. So if you're a business looking to generate new leads or increase your cash flow by picking up new clients or customers, or if you're a label looking to promote new music, then listen up. For information on advertising on Everyone Loves Guitar, fill in the short form at everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. Again, that's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. Even if you want to advertise next year, you'll get to lock into marketing your product or service at the current rates before rates go up at the end of this year. If you want to buy or sell a home or investment property and you're here in the Tampa Bay area in Hillsborough, Pinellas, or Pasco counties, then listen up. West Florida Real Estate is a local residential real estate broker that's helped over 250 Bay Area homeowners buy and sell their properties in the last four years alone. If you're looking to sell, you'll want to get their free report, The 7 Biggest Mistakes Homeowners Make When Hiring a Realtor. And if you're looking to buy a property, you definitely want to get your hands on The 21 Most Expensive Mistakes Tampa Home Buyers Make When Buying a Home. Each one of these reports is going to save you time and money. Inside, you'll discover the 7 Most Important Things to Consider When Hiring a Realtor, what to do if you're buying and selling a home at the same time, and the danger of choosing a realtor who agrees with everything you say. To get your hands on these free reports, head on over to WestFloridaRealEstate.com. That's WestFloridaRealEstate.com. Hey, this is Craig. If you like this show and you want to support it and you want to keep it free, head on over to EveryoneLovesGuitar.com forward slash support. That's EveryoneLovesGuitar.com forward slash support. Well, uh, for, for one year after school, um, I went back to D.C. and I was still staying in my engineering track and I was working at a, at a studio uh, that primarily did uh, voiceovers for, for, uh, for, for radio and, uh, and television. So I, I did that as an engineer for a year and then I thought, oh, well, now I'm going to go out to L.A. And, and see if I can, you know, find a gig. And um, 
and that's pretty much what happened. I got in my car and my dad rode out there with me and, uh, and I hit the ground running in Los Angeles. Dude, that's then, so cool. Your dad went out there with you. Yeah. Yeah. We rolled out, we rolled out there together. That's really awesome, in my, man. In my Fiat Spider. And you're, you're, that's a badass car, man. <laughs> that's a really cool car. Yeah. It broke down a lot, but it was fun when it was running. Yeah. <laughs> um, Man, you know that car? The only reason I know that car, I, I, maybe it's not the same. Do you remember that movie uh, with Dustin Hoffman, uh, Mrs. Robinson? Uh, what, what was that movie called? Um, shit. Um, the, gra the Graduate. Yeah, sorry. I had a brain fart. Okay. That, that is The Graduate, right? I'm yeah, it's about. a great. You know, it's hard to remember shit sometimes. Right. You got, right. uh, this, this guy, it was real funny. I don't get a lot of trolls, but this guy... Uh, listened to an interview I did and he gave me a comment on YouTube and I just forgot the name of the, this hit song and he goes what an idiot you are I can't believe you didn't do any research and I'm like I can't remember everything <laughs> it's, 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 it's called brain freeze I mean we all get it now especially I, I want to say it's just in our age group because but anybody can have it I have it often well, I'm do I, I did six. I've done six hundred interviews in twenty four months. Cut me some freaking slack, man. I'm like, I I can't remember my name. Right. Anyway, but the graduate he drove a spider away from the from the church with his wife, and that's the only reason okay, I remember. Have to that see was that. I such remember. a cool car, man. Really <laughs> cool car. That's how I remember that. Funny. Uh, all right. So you went back. So you then you moved out to D to L A. Yeah. You're a kid yourself. Well, I mean, I was at finished school. I'm like, what, 23, something like that. Yeah. Well, that's pretty ballsy to do. You know, I got no money, no job, let me move. Yeah, just, yeah. you know, you know, like I said, you know, a lot of support from, from, my, from my family. And uh, my mom had a cousin who was living out there. But, you know, when I first hit Los Angeles, I, went, I was staying with them for a while. And then uh, they were outside of the city. And then a, a good friend of mine, who I'd been in school with, um, who was uh, went to uh, grad school at U USC, you know, turned me on to the school there, and they had some dormitory dorm rooms that were available for the summer. Oh, great! And I actually went into LA and I stayed at USC in a dorm, <laughs> in a dorm room. That's cool. Hey, man, yeah. you got to do what you got to do. Yeah, it was probably easy to get girls because you were an older guy. Well, I mean, school was out. I mean, it was summertime, so it wasn't, it wasn't really so. There wasn't really, you know, anybody around at that time. You know, I mean, school wasn't in, but that's mm -hmm. why they had the rooms available. Okay, I gotcha. Yeah, and um, yeah, and it's from there. Uh, you know, and that's where you know where the Bill Withers gig, you know, presented itself. Talk about that, man. Well, it, it's just one of those things, man. Where you know you're. You know, I, I've given some some clinics. You know, I was talking with college students. You know, you know, and they and they all have similar questions about where, like, how do you get from here to there, and how did you do this? And a lot has to do with your network of people that you're working with or getting to know along the way. You know, um, especially when you're in school, it's like that peer group that you're with at that time. And, and and making those connections with with uh, with your with your students, and then once you're out in the world, then you, then that begins to expand. So that's exactly what happened at that time, because like I said, I I was in LA because I had a, a well one friend in particular that was very uh, who still has remained a, a very good friend of mine, Alec Milstein, and uh, he had moved to LA, and I thought, wow, Alec is out there. I'm going to just go out and go for it, and and um, had there were a few other students that I was in school with who were also, that were also in Los Angeles. So what happened was uh, surrounding the Bill Withers gig, uh, the the who became the music director Don Wyatt was also a student at Berkeley, but he came out there. Um, he he was there not at the same time that I was, but we had some mutual connections. So when he went to audition for the Bill Withers band, um, uh, there he said that he could tell that Bill wasn't really feeling any of the other musicians that had auditioned. So Don thought, told Bill, he said, you know what, I'm going to put a band together for you. Man, that's balls. That's great. 
Right. That, and that's then, initiative. So then, you know, one um, a friend of mine told Don about me. And then so that's kind of how it came about. He called and says, hey, man, you want you want to play with Bill Withers? And I mean, he, the gig didn't even exist at that point, you know. Right. But, but what we did was, I mean, we're all just out of school and uh, and Don, you know, got a bunch of us together and we had uh, and we went over to his his mom's house. I think he was still living at home at that time. And we were set up in uh, Don's mom's living room. <laughs> yeah, and we and we played through some songs, and 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 uh, all of us had you know were, had all been former students at Berkeley, and then some, you know and we all and quite a number of us knew each other you know from school you know, and uh, Don picked up the phone while we were there, and he called Bill you know like the phone was hanging on the wall like they used so to do funny back at that time, and he sat the phone down, and we played a little bit. And uh, Don goes back to the phone, talks for a minute, hangs up, and he goes, man, Bill's on his way over to the house. Now, at that time, what had, had Bill released some of his hits and yeah, this was, was for touring? Yeah, that that he did on, uh, on Sony. Uh, I, think, I think the title of the album was Watching You, Watching Me. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and, and, and we played and played and played, and we're waiting for Bill to come, and then the doorbell rings, and in walks Bill Withers. And holy shit. Was that, know, was that intimidating? This is like your first gig. No, well, not at that time. I mean, you know, we were all, I, I knew we were probably just more excited than anything else. And, and when Bill comes in and, 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 you know, after the introductions and everything, then it was kind of like, hey, do you want us to play something for you? And then Bill goes, oh, no, you guys don't need to play anything because I've been outside listening to you. Wow. That's cool. That was clever. You know, and then the next thing that happened, Craig, then you get a glimpse of why Bill's songs are written the way that they're written. You know, in a very, the, the lyrics are so simple, but not simple, but oh, get deep. Right to the point. You know what I mean? And, and, very deep, deep cat, man. And so here you go. So this is the next thing he says to us. Because, you know, I was out. He said, I, no, I've been outside listening. Okay, so that sounded pretty normal. But here comes, the, here comes the Bill Withers. I mean, that's the way I look at it anyhow. He goes, you know, I was outside, and I saw this girl, that, uh, this girl playing on the street. And she stopped playing. And she started to listen to you guys. And something like And then she began to dance. And that was a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah man very simple but but like full of meaning right and then after that it was like okay i'm gonna get you guys a rehearsal space and we're gonna do wow this <laughs> like, she began to dance play anything else after that <laughs> and that was a good thing and that was a good thing <laughs> um did he was he a big man physically big presence tall well i mean yeah, well, and, and and I mean, Bill's like I don't know what, maybe six feet, maybe yeah, and uh, soft spoken, but you know, the 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 personality and you know, it's definitely you know, huge, you know. He uh, presence. I mean, you know, yeah. Whenever I listen, he's like one of those guys. When you listen to him you just feel like you're in good hands. Like he cares about you for some reason. I've always yeah. felt like that. It's just, right. just he's, he's so, regardless of what he's singing. Yeah. He's just got a warmth about him that just wraps itself around you. And it's very hard not to uh, just fall in love with the guy's music, but just be attracted to his, the vibe he puts out. However that happens. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was very much that. I mean, and I guess, you know, at that time with us being in our early 20s, and I guess at like that time, you know, Bill was in his mid, maybe mid-50s or something. Oh, we're younger than maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, younger than, yeah, younger than, he, than I am now. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, I mean, he really mentored us, you know, and, um, and, and I'll say, and maybe some of the other, you know, uh, rest of the band members might say the same thing, but for me, it was definitely like, you know, it was, I look back at, at it now as that was, for me, that was grad school. Yeah. You know, and um, 
and you know, just as like you read in there in the intro, like the little bit off my, off my website, you know, when you're when you're a student musician uh, in that learning beginning learning phase, and you want to play everything that you think is cool, right? And and um, Bill Bill shaved all that off very or cut it off very quick to, and that's why I say about playing the song, like why are you playing what you're playing on your instrument now? How is that adding to uh, the song? So you he know, actually would ask you that. For your, it's not about playing for your ego, you know? And, 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 and one, one big moment that, that that was very known was earlier on when we were putting the show together we were playing uh, "Use Me," and Bill, Bill and Bill comes in and s just stops the rehearsal as soon as the door opened, and was verbally very upset. You know, it's like, what? What? I mean, I'll leave out the very, you know, but yeah, like, yeah. What, what are you guys playing? What is that? And he goes, that's not how the song goes, you know, something to that effect. And he goes over to, to the clavinet and he plays Use Me, as we all know. And he goes, that's how the song goes. Don't play anything extra. You play the song. And if you play the song, then it's going to take care of itself, you know. And then there's another Bill thing. And if you play anything extra, then you better be saying something. Oh man, that's cool. And and then and then and then what, how I remember it. Then he goes, you know, and I'm going to go sit over here, and when you guys get it right, then I'm going to start to sing or something like that. And then he sat in a corner. I don't know how long it was, but it maybe felt like a half of an hour with a, with us vamping on "Use Me" before he stood up and started singing the tune. You know, <laughs> so. So when I say, you know, about playing the song and staying in the groove, you know, that early experience with, with him, you know, re really speaks to that, you know. Okay. So now it's interesting because you teach, you do a lot of teaching on True Fire. And before yeah. I knew you, long before I knew you, I have one of your funk courses or maybe two. I know I have one of them. Right. And you come across, now that I'm listening to your story, yeah, very similar to that. In, right. As you're like... Uh, you, you're very accessible. You seem like, oh man, this guy really cares. Um, you know, like it's, um, there's a purpose to what you're doing, not just, you know, like dick measuring with, with your guitar sort of, you know? Right. Yeah, and it's really cool. It's just very, it, now that I'm here listening to this, man, I could see the influence on your demeanor musically. Well, thanks, man. And you know, Craig, and, and, and when you mention that, you know, there, uh, Robin, Ford recently had I, I caught a, a clip of him on 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 his True Fire where where uh, they were asking well Brad Wincoast was asking him about when he was on tour with Larry Carlton and they did like the the the, the cold kind of headline but they had the one rhythm section you know because they're both you know at that level you know how was that working with Larry and. And, and you talk and how you just mentioned that, but when you have that kind of give and take and for, uh, and there was a period, I don't know if you, if you caught this, but you know, I, I played on, on Robin's gig for, for a while, you know, I back did, I wanna, in, yeah. Back, so that was when the album Supernatural was out. And the big joke was that Santana's Supernatural was out at the same time that his Supernatural was out. <laughs> yep. And he would say, well, and I think Santana's record's doing a little bit better. A little. <laughs> but, but that was the thing. So it was like, you know, even when I was playing with Robin, you know, I had to really get back to the Bill thing, you know, and because, you know, Robin is Robin, is it, I was like, man, it doesn't make a bit of sense for me to stand up here and and try to 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 blow against Robin. It's I look I'm gonna look silly. Yeah. Plus, he probably would not be really. No, but I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. Not, that's not the right vibe. I mean, no. it, would, it wouldn't make sense. Yeah. Because what he's doing is so killing for me. I mean, and, 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 you know, coming up and listening to a lot of his, you know, his, his, 
his recording and playing, I thought, what's going to speak best to how I play? Not to think about, while well, Robin's playing like that, maybe I got to keep up. That, that would just be silly. So what I would do is I went in the opposite direction, and I'm like, hey, I'm going to do my thing. I'm just going to groove. So, you know, he's playing, you know, not trying to show off because even when he's not really going for it, he's, it's, it's always amazing. But yeah. then when he would pass me the ball, what I would often do, you know, I would just break, you know, break the band down and then just kind of lay the stuff in, in the cut, you know? And then it got to one point where like after the gig, you know, one, one, on one occasion, Robin comes and goes, man, I really love that Curtis Mayfield thing you're doing. I'm like, Bingo. Yeah, that's it. That's a home run. I'm like, I'm gonna do my thing. And 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 some of and and that kind of you know, you have to you know, you have to be you. You know. He was on my list of guys to ask you about. How did you get the gig with him initially? Um well that that that's how that full circle I mean, one piece leads to the next piece and and in that instance, it was that I had some friends that had been on his gig. Okay. Uh, uh, one which was Gary Novak. Okay. Uh, uh, who's uh, those who don't know, who's an incredible drummer. Uh, used to, used to be with the Electric Band uh, years back, and then went on to begin on numerous numerous artists. I mean, he was on the first Landis Morissette tour as well. So he was one of Robin's. Uh, band members, and then a, another friend of mine, Darren Johnson, who's a keyboard player, um, had both been on that gig. And you can hear Darren on uh, if you if ever checked out the Stanley Clark live at the Greek. It's like it's Larry Carlton, Stanley, who's playing drums on it. Is it Cobham? I'm trying to remember who's on drums on that album. And and Darren was on that tour with those guys. So they had. They had been in Robin's band, and Robin had been talking about, you know, wanting to, you know, have another guitar player, you know, on the gig, or, you know, kind of check out the two guitar vibe. And then I guess my name kept coming around, and and I got a phone call. Hey, this is Robin Ford, man. Give me your, you know, Darren and, and Gary gave, told me I should call you, and you want to come jam with me. And I went by a rehearsal space and we did a thing, and... Um, uh, was this in uh, San Fran or LA? No, this was in LA, yeah. Okay. Jimmy Earl was playing. I think Jimmy Earl was playing bass at that time. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm drawing a big blank on his name. He was the drummer with, uh, with, uh, with Hornsby. Uh, Molo, John Molo. I'm trying to think if that's his name, man. man somebody else is going to correct me on that. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> you can even comment. It's never good enough. Don't worry. No. For the, for the <laughs> internet. Don't worry. But we, but we jammed, you know, that afternoon. And, um, and, then he, and then he sent me home with some homework. And he goes, All right, what I want you to do is pick up Little Walter's greatest hits. That's funny. And, and. And you go, and listen to that, and then you're going to know exactly what we're supposed to, what we're going to be doing. That's cool. And that was it. And then I came. And then <laughs> That's weird. It, it, yeah, you know, and, and of course, and so those that don't know, I mean, Little Walters, you know, a, a blues harp player. Yeah. You know, Chicago. So, uh, and I did that, and I don't, as some guys are. I'm not a blues guitar player. That's not what I think of as, you know, that's not my genre, you know? So that was helpful for, helpful for me, you know? And uh, just to hear those, those one, four, or five changes, and if anybody out there wants to check out Little Walter's Greatest Hits, then you'll <laughs> see how that's just one, four, and five, but it's done in so many different ways and with so many different kinds of feels that uh, for me, it was, you know, that was another, you know, it was another learning moment, definitely, you know. Then, what, do, what do you consider yourself, like, your, your natural funk? Uh, that's at the root of everything. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting because, like, yeah. usually 
those two go to like i'm a blues guy as far as right. playing but my number two go to to play would be funk usually right. that that's like hand in hand so it's interesting yeah. Yeah, it's, it is interesting, Craig. I mean, and, and, and what I've seen now, especially with, with the amount of information that's on the internet, typically when someone says funk, it's not funk. Because when I say funk, I mean like P-funk. Okay, like 70s funk. Yeah, or, yeah. or the early R&B. James We're, Brown. That's, you know, yeah, that's what I'm funk. talking about. Right. Okay, so <laughs> But a lot of times when people say funk, what they're doing, it's, it's just some busy, waka, waka, like that. no, I mean funk as a genre. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know, so like for like when I put on, you know, back in you know, Jeff Beck's uh, uh, Wired in that one tune, ding, 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 and I'm like, yeah, I mean, Jeff Beck is in the funk. That's, you know, that's, <laughs> you know the song I'm talking about. I, I know the whole record, man. That's yeah. an amazing <laughs> record. That one was on Blow by Blow or it was on Wire. But, you know, but, you know, for those, the, the classic players, I, you know, for me, Jeff Beck is the one. Yeah. Because he, he is funky. He's amazing, man. Yeah. I had, I had a couple, I had, uh, Jennifer Batten on the show ages ago yeah. and, and Carmen Vandenberg, the, the young gal that did the last, a couple of tours ago. And I asked them right. both, I said, Hey man, and Jennifer's a well-trained. Right? Yeah. Jennifer was in his band, right? For three years. Yeah. Right. And, and she's a well-trained, you know, she teaches, she went to MI and I said, she's how does he, she's a monster. I said, how did he do that? She said, you know, I studied him every night for three years. I don't not any further along on how he does things now <laughs> than I was the day one. Right. Um, which is like, I, I was, I believe it, you know, he's, he's pretty unique in what he does in so many ways. Man, it, it's incredible. You know, I, I, I saw him at the Greek theater in LA when, when he was out, well, that was around the same time when he and Santana were out of co headline you know, and, and, and yeah, it, it, that's the only time I've seen him live. And it, I just sat there like, I can't even believe what I'm hearing coming out. Yeah. Talk. Just, it was just so lyrical. And um, he, I, yeah, and I, and I could see where my how you know she might say it, could could make that comment like being on stage with him every night because I mean he's got his, he's doing his it's his voice it's yeah totally everything about it is so unique to him man right while we're on that who else like is your of are your guys that you look up to who have shaped you as a player as a, like just for like guitar playing. Guitar. Uh, I guess or anything like the little yeah, Walter yeah. story was cool too. Yeah, I mean, um, I guess Al McKay, you know, Earth, Wind, and Fire. I mean, that's that's where when I say funk, I mean that's kind of where my headspace is, you know. Um, uh, and I got to know Al some when I was living in LA. He was a super cool guy, and and yeah, I mean, I'm all about just the groove, man. You know just making it feel right. Man, yeah. I saw a documentary recently on Netflix. Yeah. About, um, now I'm having a, a, a senior moment. Um, it's called Black Wax. What the hell is Ooh, that? That one I haven't seen. It, yeah, it's about, <laughs> this is horrible, man. Uh, the revolution will not be televised. What's, uh, Gil Scott Heron. <laughs> Oh yeah, no, yeah, and I've seen, I've seen it. Well, he's from DC, you know. Right, he's from DC, but yeah. his band, it's, you got to watch this documentary, is the funkiest. I mean, just incredible. The whole, yeah. it, I was blown away. I, I had no idea that he was that talented of a musician. I mean, the yeah. guy, and, and the, the guys, and and in fact, I try to reach out to the guy because i'm like i want those guys i'm even though it's from 82 i'm like i want you on my show because like that was so funky and yeah. uh i couldn't get a hold of them but man what a great band it's called anybody who listens called black wax it's gil scott okay. heron uh, I'm, not, I, I, I'm not hip to it either so i'm gonna have to check that out oh it was really interesting man yeah um let's talk about some other gigs that you did i was curious how you got the gig and uh, a cooler interesting story larry sure. graham <laughs> talk about monster bass player I didn't you know, know. I, I never played any 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 gigs with Larry, but the, the the crazy story about Graham is this. So when I was uh this was still in the 80s, you know, 
And a buddy of mine who was a songwriter was songwriting partners with the producer songwriter Preston Glass. And, and Preston Glass, you can look him up. He produced a lot of, lot of 80s hits. And Preston's wife and Larry's wife are sisters. <laughs> so, so it was kind of Holy a Holy crap, connection. that's like a... Yeah, so since my buddy was, was Preston's writing partner, whenever they were cutting demos or doing things, then they, often they would call me in to come and, and play guitar for them. Awesome. So then it, got, then it got to a point where they were working on this uh, a Japanese project with, with, with Larry. And then there you go. I'm in the studio with Larry Gray. Holy <laughs> so smokes. It, it, was really, it was really a crazy time, man. And, and Larry was super cool. And uh, there was even one session where, where uh, Butch Sams came in and played B3. I mean, it was just, just being there, man. And, and with him, like, I said, man, what about the fuzz bass? And like him clicking on the fuzz and showing me the, like, the Mutron biphase and the whole thing. Yeah, no, it was, re it was really cool. <laughs> That's great, man. Yeah. It's really, talk, about, talk about a guy who changed the course of, of music and bass playing for sure, man. Just yeah. Super you know, talented. So if you can find this recording from the 80s, I don't even know the name of the album, but it's a Grand Mountain that, uh, <laughs> that was I think it was only released in Japan, but I'll, yeah, I'm playing, I think, on a couple of songs on it. Uh, Millie Vanilli. What was that? Uh, well... You know, the, 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 the history of Millie Vanilli, you know, many people know. And I auditioned for that gig, and, 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 and I did their, their tour after the MTV tour. So I was there when, um, you know, when, when they did the Grammys and that whole big fiasco. But just to show you how, how the past can can lead where you don't expect it. So in the Millie Vanilli band, who I was just mentioning, Darren Johnson, the mm. keyboard player, was also in that band. Okay. And that was my first time working with Darren. And then how did, how did my relationship with Darren, you know, professionally, but aside from us becoming, you know, friends, how did that lead? Well, then that led into me working with Robin Ford. Right. So, and, and, and right out of the, the, the Millie Vanilli gig, what also took place is that the, the stage manager for Millie Vanilli was a guy named Malcolm Weldon, who I, uh, I think he's lately he's been out with Beyonce. He's been on, in that camp for quite a long time. But right after the Millie Vanilli gig, Malcolm Weldon was the tour manager for George Howard. And George Howard uh, was a... a you know, a jazz saxophonist sadly passed away back in you know the late '90s, but had a new, had numerous recordings like all through the '80s. Um, and Malcolm was George Howard's tour manager. George needed a keyboard player and a guitar player to go to Chicago, and then Malcolm was like, "Hey, George, man, I got these two cats, man. You know, they were on the road with me with Millie Vanilli, man, and they're gonna be perfect." And then, of course, it was a huge joke. So right. we got to Chicago. We hadn't even met George yet. You know, we rehearsed the band in L.A. And, uh, and when we got there, George came out and we did the thing. And, like, right in the middle of the set goes, man, yeah, I, you know, these two cats, man, I just met them. And, <laughs> and they just came off the tour with Millie Vanilli. Let me see if their amplifiers are on. And oh, my God. The audience, <laughs> and the audience went berserk. They probably thought it was just a joke. Let me see if their amplifiers but are on. That's real. funny. That's, we had just come off tour with Millie Vanilli. That is so funny. That's and now we're in, you know, we're in Chicago playing a jazz gig with George Howard because the stage manager from Millie Vanilli was, became a tour, was a tour manager for George Howard. So That's great. And now, of course, everything is, there's plenty of vocals that are not being sang live. So nobody even, it's funny how that changes. Yeah, I mean, well, in, in their sense, they didn't sing the vocals at all, not even on the recording. So. Oh, okay. That <laughs> I didn't know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's, 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 oh, that was, so it was like the monkeys kind of a thing. <laughs> they, yeah, they came into it 
you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's widely known now, but I mean, they came into it, that first single, uh, that girl, you know, it's true. I mean, th they became the faces in the video. Right. And, and, and then it blew up and they were on the contract. And since they were in the video, and they had to. Did they have any to, talent, legit talent at all? Like were they musicians the guys even? Were, were, were super cool. I mean, Fabrice is still around. I mean, you can look him up and find him online. He's still like playing some shows in Europe and stuff. And then he went on to, to be a DJ. I think he was at Kiss for a while after that. And um, Rob had, uh, you know, he had kind of a downward spiral. He was a great guy. And um, he just didn't bounce back from that. And, uh, and the thing is, is that neither of them were into the... Uh, Celebrity? With the, the perception of it. You know, yeah. they were not just riding the way laughing to the bank. They were, and especially Rob Palatis, he was very serious about being, wanting to be taken seriously. And because they were in this situation where they, you know, they really became the laughing stocks of all the late night shows at that time. Yeah. Especially especially with our city hall and even though if you remember the show living color of course to make the jokes <laughs> about them. one you job of course i remember that yeah you yeah yeah that, you know and 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 that was rob's thing he's like you know we, you know i don't want to be the laughing stock of our studio hall just because we're in this thing that we really don't have any control over yeah, it was a random, he was a random dude that basically got, they could have picked anybody and it happened you know, to him. Yeah. And they were on the contract, so they, they, they really couldn't do anything. And, 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 um, and then the end there, once we had finished that first tour, uh, the producer for the group was working on a new album. And the big thing was, is that the guys were going to go back to Germany and they were going to cut these vocals on the second record. But that never happened because they came back and it was like, wow, we got there and all the vocals were already cut. So we quit. Oh, wow. And that's how it came about. Otherwise, they could have just kept riding the fake wave. of being You, you got to give them credit for doing that, to be honest with you. And that's how it went down. I, you, yeah. know, I, you know, there was a special. I think when MTV was doing those things back, you know, in the late 90s, you know, they, it's pretty well documented that, that that's how it went down. And... Um, and I was there, and that's exactly what happened. I remember Rob coming up, man, they've already cut the vocals. We got there. I would quit. We're not going to do it anymore. You know, like, you know, second yeah. talk to Arnold. That's it. Yeah, that kind of accident. So, so <laughs> and, um, and that's when they said, we quit. And then that's when they did the press conference and the whole thing and gave back the Grammy. And, and it's not possible that nobody knew. Of course. Yeah, 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 of course. So they just, you know, they just put it out there. And then, you know, then they tried to come back doing their own thing. But, you know, it was, it, you know, it, it, just, uh, it just didn't bounce back in, in that way. You know, we went back out and did a few promotional shows in Europe and things with them, you know, being themselves. And, um, it, you know, just the time and it, you know, just didn't, didn't, um, didn't go. But that is pretty funny that uh joke that george howard made to be honest with yeah, him. You know, <laughs> let's so see yeah, if their amps are on that's right. that's a tough thing to overcome man right you know but that's how i came back around it's like because even when we when we when we when we uh started the millie vanilli show tour you know that was rob and, and fabrice's thing is that they wanted to have a band and they wanted to have musicians that could really play that that was that was super important to them. I mean, and and in that they were we were running a, a lot of tracks. They wanted to know that if the whole thing shut down, that the band was still going to be able to rock. Right. And and we were able to do that because you know the you know because we we weren't out there perpetrating the the group. Yeah, you're we, the real deal. You know, we could all play. And the thing is. Uh, you know, there was a lot of track though. I mean, we could show up at the at the venue when they were like testing out the sound system, and we walk in and go, "Man, we sound good up there, don't we?" You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
I mean, we were pretty much just straight playing to the, to the thing. But, you know, there was some room in there where everybody got to stretch out quite a bit. And there was a big encore. And then, uh, and that was totally live. And I came out, we were doing a, like a, like a bit of a Van Halen thing and a big guitar hero vibe. And, and uh, it was a lot of fun. It was, it was a lot of fun, you know, looking back on it. But um, yeah. So this, yeah, that was the Millie experience, which, which led into the George Howard uh, band. And, um, and I, I wrote and co-produced a song with George that was the uh, title track for his album, A Home Far Away. Uh, cool. and, um, yeah, so yeah, it, 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 that's what I say, you know, you get these pieces and one thing leads to the next thing, you know. Oh, believe me, nobody knows better than me with this show. That's all, this yeah. whole, the whole thing is work, They're like way beyond whatever I would have imagined, you know. Yeah. It's, it's very cool to be a participant in, in, in that and feel that, mm -hmm. you know. Sure. Growing the vibes how'd you uh hook up with branford and buckshot level man it's funny because i listened to a bunch of their stuff on youtube yeah you can listen to three different tracks and it has nothing to do with it's like one is a guy rapping another one is a funk track i mean it's totally different at times and, you, and then there you go buckshot yeah buckshot <laughs> yeah it was everybody's super talented in that band though man you know uh and that and that's and and that's Bradford. Yeah, you know he's not. He, you know, I maybe when someone thinks of him, maybe they're like, "Wow, he's in." You know, he's in the straight kind of jazz saxophone <laughs> lane. But but you have to remember that that was him that 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 put together the first Sting band. Yeah, I, I, you know, after the Police, mm. that was Branford. You know, so he, he, his musical, you know, he goes in, it's very broad, you know, and, and I think, and I'm sure that's what Buckshot was for him, you know, was to express all those, those areas that, you know, that he enjoyed, you know, and that's, and I'm sure that's exactly what you're hearing. I mean, so we go out there, we're playing you know, the, playing Donna Lee, but we got like the DJ and it's got a beat and, you know. Right, like, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and the, the, who, I don't know the guy's name, whoever was rapping, that guy sounded great too. Yeah, great yeah. voice, man. A few different guys. Ricky DaCosta was like the main guy. Right, yeah. Was, like threw me in there. And, um, yeah, that's just another, how did I end up there? That was on a referral from another saxophone player, Everett Hart who's also like a killer player, who's an L.A. guy. And, um, and he's friends with Bramford. And somehow Bramford must, must have been talking to him about guitar players. And, and my name got thrown out there. And, and that was a gig that there was no audition. I was just going to ask you, is there an audition? Really? I'll tell you how the audition went. The audition was on the gig. Oh, okay. Do you at least have a sound check? We had a sound check. And that was interesting. <laughs> so uh, I was already in Europe at the time. And I was going to meet up with everybody at the gig. The band had already been playing. So whether they had rehearsed their, the show beforehand, that I'm not really positive about. But um, I think Ray Fuller had been playing guitar in the band just before me. And, and I guess he had some other dates or he couldn't continue doing the gig. So then I came in. So I get the call from Bramford out of the blue. And and uh, and I get the, the show. I mean, people were still sending cassettes around at that time, you know? Yeah, so I, I was going to say, did he give you music? Did he at least give you the music? Oh, no. No. So I, how think you... I, had, I think I had a cassette of a live show and maybe the, 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 the CD or whatever. And, uh, you know, told me what we're going to be playing. And then I get to, I think we were in Zurich. And, and we're at Soundcheck, you know, all, everybody's doing the thing and I'm playing. And, and Bramford comes over to me after the Soundcheck. And this is at the point now where I thought I was dead in the water. He goes, what are you playing? <laughs> <laughs> and, 
<laughs> as I got to know Bradford, I can look Holy back and, and that's just the way he is. And he's totally cool. But if he thinks he can mess with you, then you're, and if you go down that hole, then oh, you're going to be Oh, he was just playing before. with you. He was no, just but he wasn't really. He goes, what are you doing? <laughs> but like, like very serious, like, okay, I guess I'm going to pack my shit up. Kind right. of like, wait. And he goes, I heard all that before. That's the shit that's on the record. Just do whatever it is that you do. And then he walked away. Wow. That was, that was it. And I thought, oh my goodness, I guess I'm on the next flight in the morning. So then... That was like played. a backhanded way of just telling telling you to like open it up a bit, man. That was kind of intimidating, actually. It was... So, correct. So then what happened is we played the gig and I don't even think he looked... I don't recall him looking in my direction. <laughs> Thank God, because after that, you would have... No, God, that was still part of it. It wasn't like, yeah, like, hey, man, you're... No, none of that. I really thought I was going to go home the next day. Really. Didn't say anything to me that I can remember. After the gig, and there's like a little after party, meet and greet kind of a vibe. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I guess I'm really going to go home. And then just on the slide, Bradford kind of passes by me and kind of leans in, you're the cat, motherfucker. <laughs> Holy you know, something shit. like that. That probably took about a million pounds off your shoulders and, at that point. And wow. That was the next big musical education. With Branford. Right. By taking from Bill now to that experience working with with, with Branford in that you get outside of that thing where you think you're playing what you need to be playing or that kind of where you just, you've learned what you learn and then you just play. It's almost like, you know, like with, you know, I, I, I've been involved in martial arts too. So it's like you're learning all these techniques and this and that. And it's the same thing with music. You're learning the scales, you're learning this and that. But at the end of the day, when you hit the stage, you don't think about any of that. It's just like we're having a conversation right now. We're not thinking, oh, what's my next sentence going to be? At least I don't think we're thinking. No, about no, no, no. Definitely you know what not. I mean? The words are just, they're just flowing God, out because I, you've already yeah. you've built up your vocabulary already. Mm. You know? And, and all that information just, and then it has to flow out. And, and, um, it's funny. Was, I'm sorry. Yeah. I apologize. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, man. And that was, that was a big thing, like with working with him and, you know, some of the other guys in the band, you know, that everyone's playing is such a high freaking level. Um, on that first tour, I mean, Mino Santa Lou was there, and Joey Calderazzo, Frank McComb, just the whole band. Russell Gunn was on trumpet, John Touche, and the, just Rocky Bryant was playing drums. Just the whole, everything about it, everybody was like on that high performance level. And I'm there, you know, and, and, and at some point it's like, you know, and there were so many people on stage trying to find their spot. And even in what seemed like kind of chaos, Bramford just was always just kind of cool, observing everything. To a certain point, the, the drummer and I were like getting ready to say to Bramford, like, dude, man, don't be like, maybe we need to like practice during the sound check and work <laughs> some of this stuff out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and Bramford, before we could even say anything, he was like, oh, man, Diane, Diane, don't worry about it, man. It's going to be cool. It's going to be cool. And then a few gigs in, then you, it began to take on another thing. Because you, you began to feel each other's vibe and find your own right. spots. Right. Yeah. And that's when I say, like, when you, like you mentioned, like, those different things, and I'm talking about how Bradford hears the thing. Just like, I guess, with any of those, the great band leaders over time, we think like, like Duke Ellington or Miles or the guys that brought different peoples together to play. And then you find what's going to make it work within the talents of the guys that are in the band, you know. And then Bramford said, you know, 
when you guys were kind of feeling like it was a kind of a chaos, he said, I heard it in a different way. He said, I could hear that everybody was still listening. Okay. I mean, I'm like, wow. So you, you could tell that we weren't thinking that it was all like blazing right now, but everybody was kind of, hey, what's he doing over there? And what's he, I mean, and, and, and I really think that that's a different level of listen, like you listen to a band and you could tell that everybody's listening to, to shape the sound that, I mean, that's what I said. That was like my second, that was like my next, you know, maybe that the other thing was like the grad school and this was like maybe the, like the- <laughs> Your doctorate. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's really cool. You know, I, the first, I felt like that one time about, I'm not a deadhead, but when I was yeah. a kid a little bit in my 20s, I, I like late 20s, early 30s, I started listening to Grateful Dead. And my wife, God bless her, who hates pretty much every music I've ever listened to. Yeah. She, she uh, I, I put the Grateful Dead on one day. We just first started dating maybe even. And I said, she goes, do you like this? And I said, yeah, can't you really hear how connected these guys are? And she goes, no, but, but that, so I understand what you're saying. Cause one time I was listening to them and I did sense that like, and that is that, and they are so together that band or they were, you know, back. Right. Then. Um, but yeah, I could see that that is next level stuff, man, because he's right. thinking about, well, number one, if you're all listening, that's a right. band of contributors, givers right. versus right. takers. Right. which is most important to the guy who's running the show. Right. You know, so that is really cool. Yeah, yeah. I, could, I could see that, man. You know, and you mentioned the dead. So, I mean, I don't know if you checked out any of those clips, but, you know, you, there's, a, there's a few on there with, with Branford playing with the dead. With the Branford most, playing with the dead? Yeah, I didn't know okay. that. That stuff's on YouTube, man. Yeah, I'm going to have to see, check that out. Yeah, Bob, Bob Weir came out to one of our gigs. <laughs> <laughs> Just you saying that sounds weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah he's on he's on he's on yeah you can find him on youtube i'm gonna check that out grateful dead and then grab for my salad's all in one search you're gonna find him <laughs> that's cool <laughs> but he's probably played like i'm sure he's played with government mule and and all those cats he's just one of those kind of guys who's out with everybody you know because he's know, so talented I mean, the the last bunch of dates that we did were with uh a widespread panic mm. yeah and that's cool and we opened some shows for them. They were on a shed tour that summer. And it was really cool. I mean, they gave us, you know, they have a huge fan base. And it was a great experience being out with them. And their thing was, wow, you're the first, you guys are the first band that our fans actually come, come in to see before we hit the stage. And no, I can see wow. that. Because they have an eclectic audience, you know. They're doing, yeah, I could, that's a good fit, actually. You know. And unfortunately, Columbia didn't see it that way back then, so that was pretty much the end of it all. That's too bad, man. <laughs> they wanted they wanted us to continue on on a tour with them, but uh, we just didn't have enough tour support to to keep it going. So that that was pretty much the end. But yeah, that was the last thing. When yeah. you say that, what does that mean? They want you to like we want you to continue playing, but we're not going to pay for you. We're not going to pay no, you no, any no. money. What? Yeah, we didn't have any tour support from the from the label. What is, but what does that mean exactly? Uh, so we, the, the band was on Columbia Records, you know, and, and, and basically they didn't want to put any, any of their, their budget into promoting Buckshot La Funk or, you know, where they could have kept us out on tour with widespread panic. They were, you know, as a group, we probably could still be playing right now. Yeah. Because some think that it's still a group that's, that's performing, but, you know, it hasn't been since the, since the late 90s. Yeah. Really cool band. Yeah. How, how did you get into production and, and how did you wind up producing Larry Carlton? Um, uh, you know, as I said earlier on, so, you know, in, in school, you know, that was really the track that I was in, intending to start off on was, was going into recording and engineering. And I also always had a passion for recording and things. So how it came about was, um, you know, it's still like the, all these pieces of things coming together. So in, in the earlier L.A. days, well, Reggie Hamilton, who you just had on your show, you know, we were we had a we had a fusion band, a jazz fusion band in L.A. 
Okay, so so uh, what had happened is, you know, so we had this band, like I said, Reggie, Reggie was in that group. And also in, in that band was a saxophonist uh, who, who's now called Boney James. You know, okay. back, then, back then he was still, was still Jim Oppenheim. But yeah, so Boney James was, was in the band and, and he got a record deal with Warner Brothers and, 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 and the producer for his album was Paul Brown. And through my relationship with Boney and, and, and working with him, like some of those earlier albums, I contributed you know, a, a number of songs along with some, you know, some production work. And on his, on Boney's records? On Boney's records, yeah. Um, the first album uh, was Metropolis and that's what he got him to deal with one. And then the second album, Backbone, was called Backbone. Uh, the title track of that album was, was, was a track that I worked on. Um, then there's a there's a couple more in there that I'm getting a little fuzzy on, but if you look up Boney James, you'll find me on a, on a, on a bunch of those earlier albums. And the producer for Boney James at that time was Paul Brown, and Paul Brown was came on to produce the, that Larry Carlton album, the one we're talking about. So uh, it was actually Paul who was the producer, but through him knowing me with my work with Boney. He was like, hey man, I'm working on Larry Carlton. Maybe you have some tracks that might be cool for for, for the Carlton album. That's so pretty. There, so there you go. That one thing um, connecting you to the next thing. So um, And you so know I what's cool that. about music? So, sorry, yeah. I don't mean to cut you off, but yeah. um, when you're dealing with cool people without egos, yeah, they don't think, well. Um, I've got Larry Carlton here. I need to get a certain, you know, guy who's got a, you know, he liked what your work was. You know, right. you didn't have to be this name. No. You know, and I'm, I'm not minimizing no, your, no, I, where you no, were, I, but you know what I'm saying? And I do know what you're saying. I love that about musicians because right. it's everybody's um, just so open and cool and like if you're a cool person you're probably going to be able to contribute something cool is the vibe absolutely and that's the way like i don't know my simple world like that would be great if everything was like that you know and that but it tends to get a things tend to have an agenda sometimes and i'm right. really bad with that i'm kind of like allergic to that and i really i really appreciate all of you guys so much for that because very few people are like that in music right Anyway, sorry, man. I just that was really cool. Yeah, but that's important, you know. I mean, and you know, that's how that uh, that's how that came about. And the only thing that that could have really been better for for me about it is that if I had actually been there when Larry was cutting his stuff. <laughs> yeah, but... and and I didn't meet him uh, in person until to until many many years later, you know. And uh, he was playing at the Blue Note uh, here in New York. And I came up to him afterwards and I, I introduced myself and I mean, literally didn't know who I was. I mean, there was really no reason for him to until I told him who I was. And it was like, and uh, yeah, so that album deep into it, uh, deep into it was the title track. And then also did another song on there called Morning Magic, um, which was the single off of that album. And uh, I mean, and, and the stuff that Larry played on there, I mean, He's another person who can just take something that when you detach it by itself, it, it could really be a nursery rhyme. Yeah. But then when you put it with his phrasing and, and just where he's coming from, you know, nobody else could do that. Yeah. You know, I, you know, like he made a melody, like, like, like two like kind of major arpeggios. I mean, it sounds like, Hey, I got a new song for you. Check it out. <laughs> you know, people are like, oh, okay, we'll get back to you on that. But if you hear it in that, that one's more than magic. And when you hear it in context with the way, I was like, how did he come up with? Well, he's yeah. Larry Carlton. Dark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so it gets deeper than the notes. It's just part of that what comes from inside of you. And um, I think all those cats that worked on Steely Dan had that sort of ability. Right. You know, it's just like some magic. I don't know what else to call it. Right. 
you know, it's, it's, it's that, it's that gift, it, you know, um, yeah, that, that's the, that's the, the lucid part, you know, that, that, um, that you can take someone like Carlos Santana and when he hits the stage, he plays one note and you're wow, you know, it's Santana or like, or when, when BB King would play or so many players on whatever their instruments are that they just, you know, who they are beyond just, well, I hear my chops, you know? Yeah. I, mean? I mean, like we talked about Jeff Beck earlier. Here's another one. Who else is going to sound like that? Yeah. Nobody, nobody. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that was a real treat, man, be, like being involved on that. And then sometime later, then um, uh, after introducing myself to Larry, then I went back and I did a remix for him um, that I, that I uh, on, uh, trying to remember that song, I think it was called Night Sweats. Um, it was on, the, I think that album was called Sapphire Blue. And, mm -hmm. um, and he had had an earlier arrangement that was very kind of like, you know, jazz rhythm section kind of thing. And then I put it like a synth bass and like some more loops and beats. And then I, and I also snuck in some wah guitar. On the <laughs> right just, on. Because, just because I had to. Yeah, man, why not? <laughs> did, did that create, that was a Grammy nominated record. Did that create yeah. opportunities for you? production mind um i wouldn't say that it nothing that came about that directly you know afterwards no i mean no not really wow i'm surprised that's really yeah. Oh, yeah. everybody listening this is a grammy nominated larry carlton producer here man if you need some <laughs> help producing your records man i'll create some damn opportunities because you deserve it man well thanks man yeah i mean it, it, i mean production and songwriting i mean that's you know that's a big part i mean i have a that's a big part of what I do, you know, and over the years of, you know, I've, I've been very involved with that. I mean, even, even to today, you know, with, uh, I've been, have been these past few years working on this show, Teen Titans Go. And, um, and for anyone that's out there listening, it's got any kids that watch the show, they might know me from Teen Titans Go because I'm a character in one of their episodes as myself. Are you serious? Yeah. That's pretty cool, man. Yeah, it's it's a group that was created. It's called B E R, and B stands for Burnett, and E is the R the co-writer of Frank and Nia, and uh, the R is Billy Regan, and uh, and it, it that's a it's a long mir miraculous story in itself. So maybe later I, I'll send you a link that that unravels the whole. Uh, the whole experience with it. There's like an M NPR interview. The song is called "The Night Begins to Shine," and um, and it's been kind of percolating around there now, or brewing for the last well, maybe four four years. And they cre have created uh, Warner Brothers. You know, through Teen Titans Go has created a whole kind of an alternate reality for the show around this song, which kind of has like an eighties kind of a pop sound to it. They've created this alternate universe within Teen Titans Go that has, that transforms them into like an eighties heavy metal style uh, artwork. So, yeah. and so you're, you do the, the scores or the, what do you do? You do all the music for Teen Titans Go? Tell no, me I, I don't do all the music for them. I mean, they have, they have a, 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 a composer for the show, a guy named uh, Jack, Jared Farber, who, who does the most of the music, but what they, they also use uh, a lot of musical underscore from a, a Telepictures music library, which I've been a big contributor to that. What's underscores? Music. So that's like when the show is playing and you hear some dialogue and then there's some music playing in the background okay. that, that's there. And it's not supposed to get in the way. It's supposed to kind of enhance the. Sure, sure. Yeah. So, they, so that's what they call music underscore. So I've been doing that uh, for a number of years now for, for different shows. And um, this was just one song that, 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 uh, that came out of their library. And it, it came uh, the theme song for their character, Cyborg. Oh, that's awesome, man. So, I mean, if you look, I mean, anyone that's listening, just jump on, the, you know, this thing called the internet, just pop in, the night begins to shine, and you're going to, it, it, like I said, anybody out there that's got some, you know, grade school kids or, or, or adult kids. Yeah. And beyond, and, you know, yeah, they, you're going to get, you're going to be like, oh, my God, that was him. Okay, it'll be kind of like that. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, I'm real. I'm a real person in the real world, and you can also see me in the cartoon you know, as uh, as myself. That's so. Was that funny to do that? It was a trip. I, I can't even believe I did it. We got another. We got another episode that's going to drop. Uh, I think they said it's going to be Memorial Day, so you got to wait till May. But there'll be a return of. of, uh, of so you're playing yourself, Carl Burnett. I'm. I'm myself. That is quite fun. What but did your kids say? Start, when we start our jam, and we, then we, then we transform into our, the superhero versions of us of ourselves, and uh, that was Dude, kind that's of that's what a rock star does. You know, and <laughs> so I was when they told me I had to have a superhero voice. Somehow, the only thing that would come back to me was like He Man and Masters of the Universe. Like, so I had the best. So then I, I beefed up my voice. You know, that's good, man. <laughs> what did your kids say? What did your daughter say? Well, you know, they're teenagers, so they're kind of like, yeah, okay, yeah, it's cool, but, you know, I'm still at, at home with my dad. And, you know, kind of yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Fun, man. <laughs> hey, um, you grew up in D.C. What was your childhood like growing up? Um, well, you know, I'm, a, I'm an only child, uh, but, but I have a lot of cousins and a lot of family that was in the D.C. area. Um, uh, some And some of them were are musicians and so we had you know you know we jammed a lot back then and um and the other thing that was i think very important you know was that um i got to see a lot of music a lot of concerts as a teenager um there's a theater in dc called the carter baron amphitheater and it's it's in the center of the city in rock creek park and Anyone who was anybody performed there, you know, over the years. And, um, and I got to see uh, many, many shows there because my dad was, you know, working, uh, was involved with the National Park Service. And this uh, amphitheater was part of Rock Creek Park. And um, my cousin and I, uh, we went to just about every concert there one summer and saw... I mean, just start naming some groups. I mean, I can't even think. Me, tell me, knee jerk reaction, best shows, like, top best three. Okay, the, the the person who still sticks in my brain, who some may not know, is Betty Davis. Wow, are you hip to Betty Davis? You mean the not the actress? No, no not not Betty Davis. That Betty Davis. So this is Betty. No, Davis. I'm not. Uh, uh, funk rock pioneer you can look her up on 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 the internet <laughs> you know the first album betty davis i think when i don't even think it had a title i think it was just betty davis nasty gal but the thing is when what she was doing at that time i mean a, a woman fronting the band it was it was a funk rock band but i'm going to tell you who was on the album that was the album for me. So the, this is the rhythm section. Are you ready? Yeah. Larry Graham. Oh my God. Uh, Greg, uh, the drummer from from Sly Stone. Uh, 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 what's his gosh? I'm drawing, Enrico. Uh, gosh, I'm drawing a freaking blank. I can't look him up because I'm on my phone to talk to you. So, <laughs> so it's Larry Graham. Uh, Neil Schoen is on guitar. And and then the drummer from. Sly. Sly. Wow. That's the rhythm section. That's weird that I didn't know Neil even played funk. I... <laughs> Kill it. I need to listen to that record. And, and I have just seen him recently. Uh, Joe Bonamassa has posted some clips with Neil Schoen jamming with him. And, 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 and yeah, he's really, really killer. And on that album, you hear, you'll hear him playing something and you'll think, wow, I didn't know he would, might play like that. Yeah. Wow. Now That's you're going to cool. check it out. Oh, I'm going to check it out. I wrote it down. I will be checking out this afternoon. So, so that, that, that one definitely sticks out. I mean, I saw Earth, Wind & Fire back then, like off that first album, uh, like Keep Your Head to the Sky. They, they performed back um, uh, who else it's kind of sticks out? Rare Earth. Uh, wow. <laughs> uh, that was a great band, man. Who else did I see back? Wild Cherry. <laughs> you know, any, any, all the R&B groups. I mean, just name them. You know, 
from anybody from the spinners, four tops, um, shy lights, any any R and B vocal group that was happening in the seventies, I saw them. And back like, in the I day, that was when they played somebody. everything on AM radio, right? And it was all mixed. It was you know Earth Wind and Fire followed by Charlie Daniels or something you know, like that. Yeah, you know, Cool in the Gang back then. I still have a clear memory as a kid, like being on on the on the side of the stage and at Cool Cool in the Gang's playing this song. Who's going to take the weight? That that's one of the examples on my Funk Wild guitar video, a True Fire. Well, I, I talk about that because I'm doing I, I I do a little demo of that song explaining that. The wah pedal doesn't always have to be going like waka 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 kind of like yeah. this. So this song, "Who's Gonna Take the Weight," is is part of that. But I remember watching him on the side of the stage going because <laughs> he's like right in front of me, you know. Because we had like little VIP section where we, were, we thought we were really cool because we were just like kids, you know. Oh, that so is we, cool when you're a we kid. Got to sit right on the side of the stage and take all of this in. And I think that was, I'm sure that that had a lot of influence later. It's like, wow, just taking all those, that live performances and, you know, that, that summer that we were, uh, you know, catching all that music in, in D.C. So, yeah, you know, now, you know, people ask, ask me, it's like, wow, you're from D.C. But, yeah, I, didn't, I left D.C. to go to school, so I didn't really get into the music scene in D.C., and now when I look back on it, I think, wow, there was, there was a lot going on. I mean, you had, um, I mean, you know, the, the punk rock group Fugazi. Oh, there was tons of punk in D.C., yeah, man. Okay. Heavy Fugazi, duty. Fugazi, those guys were in high school with me, but I did not know them. <laughs> it's a totally like, different. They were there, they were in my school. Uh, so, yeah, yeah like Fugazi, uh, um, uh, who else? Uh, um Gosh, I'm, why am I drawing a bank, a big freaking blank right now? Um, I know. I, while you were talking about that, I was saying, I'm thinking to myself, there was a heavy punk scene there. I'm not, I'm not that guy yeah. either, but I know there right. was a heavy punk yeah. scene. Yeah, I mean, Fugazi was happening. I mean, after that, and, I mean, of course, the go-go scene, Chuck Brown. I've had some, a, a buddy of mine who's played with him since then. But yeah, I didn't get involved in the music scene in D.C., you know, because as I got older, I wasn't in D.C. And, sure. And, any, anymore um yeah but yeah i heard a lot i mean but still you know i mean growing up and hearing the go-go and all that you know that was a big part of you know my influence back then you know so you went to berkeley then you went out to la when did you move to new york and what prompted that move came i moved to new york back in uh 2000 and that move came about due to to the most pivotal move I've made in my life, and that was getting married. <laughs> and so you're still that, married, right? Yeah, my yeah. wife is in Switzerland, and um, and we met out there. I mean, to make a long story short, just she did not connect with the vibe in LA, so that brought us to New York. And the interesting thing is, is that we got married in Hawaii. In where? Hawaii. Dude, you know what's funny? I did as well. <laughs> That was what you were saying. Oh, that was what we had in common. Oh, snap. That's pretty cool, man. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we got, we got married on, 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 on Maui, and we found like a spot out there with just some waterfalls, and we just took a little walk into the, into the little rainforest vibe and, and um, you know, got a, a minister out there, and we just went, and a couple of uh, friends who live still live out there on Maui, and it was it, it was us and the minister and his wife and my my friends and, and their kid who was a kid that that, that time was now in his twenties, and uh, and that was it, man. We got married on Maui, and, and soon after that, we moved to New York. That's pretty cool, man. Congratulations! That's a long yeah. time. Congratulations! That's nice, man. Yeah, that, Ann, I remember Ann planned it. She bought a magazine. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no internet in yeah. 1994 or whatever. And she yeah. just called him up and did this. We had a minister, same thing, but we did one thing really stupid. We, we wore, I wore a suit. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know that, man, I should be wearing a suit here. I should be wearing shorts and a flowery, whatever, but we, she yeah. had a proper wedding dress and a suit. And then, uh, in fact, on our, we walked into the hotel the day of our wedding and this guy says to me, he goes, hey, man, do you know O.J. Simpson? And I said, yeah. And he goes, man, he just 
watch this on TV. And it was the same day, the OJ thing where he's driving the white Ford Bronco down. The, and my wife, of course, she's from England. She's like, who's OJ Simpson? <laughs> She'd been here quite a while, but she didn't know. She didn't grow up with him. Yeah, so it was pretty wild. That was a nice place to get married, though. I'm, I'm happy I did that. Wasn't that nice? Didn't you find it nice? What's that? Wouldn't you find that nice getting married there? Like it's very romantic. Oh, it was incredible. Yeah. It was incredible. I mean, and the thing is, you know, it, you know, it was we just kept it low key. You know, we didn't have a you know a, a big wedding ceremony kind of thing like that. But we we did that there, and then our our, uh, our friends, you know, they had like a little reception for us at their at their house afterwards. And then we came back when we got back to LA. Then you know, we got together and you know had some friends come and have like a little reception vibe there. And um, I guess, you know, through playing at weddings or different kind of events like that over the years, you know, doing something that was outside of the traditional kind of wedding, you know, and that, that fit both of us. That's cool. Well, yeah. hey, man, all that shit doesn't matter anyway. You're still yeah. 20 years later. Yeah. I'm still with my wife 27 years later. That's that's the magic, not like yeah. how much did you spend or how many people came and got drunk at your wedding man that's not, absolutely that's not the stuff you remember yeah. right on man that was cool yeah, yeah well congratulations man because staying together nowadays that, that's not the, you know that's not not always the common path no well i'm sure it's the same with you our kids we're the only parents like none of them or the friends have parents that have been together right. or that are together unfortunately mm -hmm. yeah um Low points, Carl. What are some of the low points or darker periods you've had to deal with and how'd you get through them? Mm. Well, I guess, I mean, you know, being in this business of being self-employed and maybe you experience the same thing, you know, you have, you have ups and, and downs and, you know, you have the, you can have these lows and you just got to just, just keep faith and, 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 and pray. And um, God, I think I would just leave it at that. Yeah. No, I have experienced the same thing, of course. Let me yeah. ask you this. Yeah. What is your, you just said, uh, keep faith and keep praying. Do you look at like all these events, right? Yeah. This happened and then this guy and he told somebody and, their father-in-law needed somebody or whatever. And then they call right. you. Right. Do you look at that as like a God thing or do you look at that as random serendipity? And, and there's no right or wrong. I'm just curious. Sure. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that. So one of my wife's qu quotes is she goes, I don't believe in coincidences. Right. And you know, if you're open to that, I, I guess, uh, Craig, it, it, it's, I mean, I look at it like that. I mean, it's all God's plan. Yeah. Okay. You know? And, and even like my relationship with, uh, just to, just to put all those little connections in, 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 in place. Like for instance, you were, you were talking about my, my true fire courses. How did that come about? Yeah. How did that, that you might want to say, how did it come about? That how did that come about, about Carl? Well, that came about because I had played with Robin Ford. Oh, and Robin got you to True Fire because he's but, a True Fire artist. Yeah. And, and the reason that, that he even made that connection is that, you know, he, he, they, he, he travels around and he does this thing called the Guitar Dojo, you know. So he's yeah. like city to city and the guys like have a camp and they come out and do a thing. So they were up in the Catskills um, and they had one of their clinics, you know, just maybe about an hour and a half from my house. So I went up there that one summer, you know, just to spend the like afternoon. Indian something. Yeah, called. exactly. Yeah. So I was up there just kind of hanging with them. And, and all the guys are, you know, geeking out and Robin's doing his thing. But what he was playing, he wasn't, you know, he was explaining something about playing some rhythm parts, you know? And I told him, after, I said, man, Robin, I said, man, it's really cool that, that the group of guys are really connecting with what you're talking about with, you know, playing you know the, the the thing within the song because that's what you're going to be doing mostly you're not going to be soloing right and he goes yeah you know and there's there's been um a lot more focus on that lately and, you know and i've been doing and 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 then he was talking about true fire and he goes you know what and you ought to do a video for true fire boom there <laughs> you go okay 
and then and then that's how it started. Very cool. <laughs> so yeah, I was just curious. As simple as that, you yeah. know. So another, and and I guess you know, also Craig, it, you know, and that's just that part of just putting yourself out there and being. I mean, if I hadn't gone up there to hang out with him that day, I mean, where would that have ever come about? I, you know, probably maybe. not. Probably. Yeah, probably not. Yeah. No, you have to do the work. It's not like you can sit down right. and like, hey, God, I'm waiting. It, the, right. I don't think it works like that. You know, no, you, you actually gotta, have to be moving to do something. You got to be moving. I mean, it's, it's, it's not often that I'm trying to think of if there's ever been just a random call. No, because the random call out of nowhere, it's always got a connection to something. It has to. I don't, I don't think everybody, I don't think I've ever gotten a call with someone who's just kind of fishing on the internet and go, hey, I thought nothing. Yeah, no. yeah, right. That doesn't happen ever, no. ever, ever. Yeah. That, I haven't experienced that. <laughs> I think most people haven't. It's always, you know, this person met that person, you know. Right. right. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Uh, you just talk, since True Fire is a good segue, you, you do a lot of teaching. Tell me the top three mistakes that you see, let's say, intermediate level guitarists making in their playing. There's, there's only one mistake. Yeah. Not keeping time. Interesting. That's it. <laughs> Spoken like a true funk guitarist, man. <laughs> Not keeping time. I mean, I can I can elaborate on that, but that would be like a whole other segment that you might go on for another another hour. Not keeping time. Yeah, but that's I think you know, Craig. That's the overlooked essential of many that might just be starting out. So if you're if you're uh, out there and you're lit, when you if you're hearing me saying this right now, I'm going to tell you the exact same thing that I've told some of my, the guys that I teach here locally, you know, that are in high school now. Uh, if a musician tells you that they can't play with a click track, and when I say a click track, I mean just a metronome doing this. Mm -hmm. If they tell you that they can't do that, that means they can't play. Yeah, right on, man. <laughs> yeah. Because everything, I mean, everything is, is, is keeping time. Some form of keeping time i mean maybe that time may be an elastic time you know like as in well classical music is that keep yes it may slow down it may speed up but it still has a an ebb and a flow to it right with the conductors doing so yes everything keeps time and if you can't keep time that's the only for me that's the only lesson you got to keep time thanks man that's, that's the lesson i teach i'm teaching over and over again Keeping time. <laughs> hey, what's your, uh, let's talk about gear for a few minutes. Some, what's your yeah. go-to guitar that you, not for sessions, but the one you reached for that you like playing, you like the tone, and what would yeah. make up your top Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I have a Telecaster. I mean, that's the one that I kind of. The overlooked. pink, the pink shell, what is it called? Yeah, it's a shell, like shell pink. Tele. Shell pink, yeah. Um, I, like the Telecaster, I guess, has for me kind of become my go-to voice, you know, guitar wise over the years. Yeah. Why, why is that? As opposed to like a Strat, because where you see most funk players. Well, for the, well, if you think, I mean, you think go back to like what, uh, 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 Booker T and MGs. I mean, that's all telly, you know? So, but, uh, Al McKay's telly back in some day, I mean, he played the, the I think like a 335 too, but yeah, Telecaster is, um, I think Steve Cropper played a telly back that's, in the day, exactly, too. That's yeah. exactly what I was thinking about. Yeah, um, yeah so the, I guess the simplicity of it is just, it's a rawer sound for me than like playing a Strat. Um, I mean, I will play my Stratocaster for some things, but when I'm just doing, when I think that I want to, to feel like my voice I, I express that best with the Telecaster, I think. Um, what you, how old is that Tele? Is that an old one or uh, 90s? or? No, nah, I got found it in a pawn shop years and years ago. The neck date is a 68. Oh, wow. So, I mean, it's got, some, it's, it's got a lot of old stuff. I mean, whether it's like the original thing that got put together at, at the vendor shop, that I don't know. 
but the neck date is a, is a 68. And I, you know, I had a buddy uh, out here, uh, Rob Banter, who's a pickup, kind of like a new pickup guru dude. Uh, Gemini Pickups, you can you can find him on on uh, on Instagram. But he kind of we took my bridge apart one day because I was like, man, what kind of pickup is in this thing, man? Because it's got kind of a funky bridge pickup. And I think he was like, man, this is like another like old 60s thing. I don't know if the thing was like a broadcaster or something. But yeah, it's got some old parts. And uh, yeah, it, it, it's a pre-eBay guitar. Yeah. So that's when you can like kind of go around and if you find, you can find a deal out there, you know. It yeah. doesn't really happen like that anymore, unfortunately. Everybody knows everything. No, <laughs> it's too much access to information on that. Yeah. <laughs> What would be your number two and number three? Well, number two is definitely the Strat. That's and um, and the same thing with my Stratocaster. That's a, like 60, 64. and um, that also came about just my you know back then if you could you could put your name you know if you had a favorite shop or something you could put your name on a list, and that's what I did. I said, man, when you find a Strat that comes in, I don't need a museum Stratocaster. It's just got to be, you know, something that I can gig with. And uh, this was that uh, I've got Bill Asher, who's a guitar builder, who's gone on to. Yeah, I've heard his name for some reason. He does these Weisenborns, like the lap, the lap steels. That's like his big okay. thing. And, and uh, uh, he, uh, he had to shop in Santa Monica, and I put my name on a list, and they called me, and I went over to the thing, and, and I picked up that guitar, and I strummed one chord on it, and just acoustically, before I even plugged it in, I was like, okay, that's it. What color is that? I don't think I've ever seen you play that. It's black. Yeah, it's black strap. Black strap. And uh, the thing that's quirky about it, um, I guess at some point it must have had a refin or something because the headstock decal is like a 70s Fender logo with the big fat black yeah. letters. Not yeah, yeah. Red, but it's still got the small 60s headstock, but with the fat 70s that's logo. That's weird, yeah. Yeah. I like uh, guitars like that that are like, you know, not conventional. Right. Especially if it feels and sounds good. I mean, that's all that really matters. Yeah. You know? And so what would that, be number that would three? Be, that would be the number two. Uh, number three, um, the, number three would be the telly again. A another telly. <laughs> no, no. It would just it would circle Oh, that's back it. Circle back. Okay, that's it, man. That's cool. <laughs> Simple guy. I like that, man. It, it would circle back around, yeah. You seem like an a uncomplicated guy in, in general. You seem pretty like... Oh, thanks. Thanks. Would, would, your, would your wife agree with that? Am I uncomplicated? Uh, yeah, I would let her answer that question. I would put her on the camera if she would. <laughs> but, she, but she stepped out. Yeah, I'll defer away from that one. <laughs> yeah. uh, now, I will say, though, but it, seriously, though, I mean... I think what she might say is that I tend to be a minimalist um, mm. and, and maybe that's why I kind of gravitate towards a Telecaster, you know, it's because it's not a lot of bells and whistles. I mean, you get, you get a front pickup, you got the two together or you got the bridge. I mean, it doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles. I mean, uh, I mean, it, it, it's, for me, it's an instrument in, in its tone, it, it's just raw. So you have to really commit to everything you're doing on it to, I mean, that's, it, it works for me, you know? Um, but I think that's probably what she would say is that I'm a, I'm a minimalist. Minimalist is good, man. Simple is good. Yeah. Sometimes it, maybe, maybe it bites me in the butt sometimes, but you know. Like what? Like you're not doing enough. You need to show them what you can do. I'm like, but you know, it's interesting because I, 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 I I either read or heard John Mayer on an interview once and he was, and I guess maybe he had sat in on or, or came on stage and sat in and jammed with another band that wasn't his band. And the, and the interviewer was saying like, wow, your guitar playing. How come you don't do that on your gig? Like when you're, and he goes, well, because my gig doesn't call for that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> serve the song right. and now we go all the way back to bill yeah yeah that's cool man no i think that's good right <laughs> but i most guys that i've spoken to 
are confident enough to know when it's their job to play and when it's their job to lay back. And if you're a sideman, it's generally mostly laying back. Right. If yeah. you want to eat. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and like what you're saying there, you know, with that laying back and then and when you are in that role, what's the main thing that you have to do in that context when you're playing with other people, you got to keep time. Yeah. There you, you know, go. One of, one of my students recently was like, you know, man, it, you know, I understand, you know, but when I'm playing with other guys and I'm locking in with the drummer and I'm playing, you know, then I feel uncomfortable. I said, well, what happens when they lay out? <laughs> Suppose you have to play the intro. Then what are you going to do? And he's like, okay, you know. <laughs> Get a yeah, metronome. You know, so you can't, you know, can't, that, that can't be a, your, your crutch to say when somebody else is keeping time, you're going to keep time. No. Yeah, right. You know, <laughs> Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. So, the, so funny. wait a minute. So, so for you guitar fans out there, and I, I know you, you know, you, you're doing the thing too. So these, so with that student, so I gave him three songs to work on that all have guitar intros, because you have to set the groove up. Long, long train running. Mm -hmm. uh, Play that funky music. Uh huh. Free ride. Okay. Yeah, that's a great one. <laughs> And, and Funk 49. Great one, yeah. You know, okay, we're gonna stand in kind of rock and roll lane, but some, a funky rock and roll lane. Yeah. And those are all guitar intros where you have to set the groove up. So how are you gonna not keep time? Funk 49, that's one of the- come in? How's anybody gonna feel the vibe of the song? It's all on you. That's one of the best intros ever, man, Funk 49. Yeah. Such and, a cool and long train running is killer. Yeah, yeah it mean, really is. It's all it's all strats, strat, strat, yeah. strat sound. And and the simplicity of it's not difficult to play. No, it's a great song. You know, but what the thing is is making it feel good. And how do you do that? <laughs> Keep time, one. boys and girls. Hey man, tell me your uh, knee jerk reaction. Top three Desert Island discs, just for now, because I know Ooh. that will change anytime. Oh my goodness, man, that's hard. But you know, I can tell you one thing that I have listened to recently, like because you know I have teenagers, and uh, the the Billy Eilish stuff is really cool. Billy Idol, Eilish. Uh, She's been, like a new kind of pop singer. You know, it's like you know some of these groups now that. Um, you know, I mean, the guys now, you know, they're producing stuff in their bedrooms. Yeah, right. You know, but I mean, in, in a different lane, well, that would be hard, hard, hard to answer. So, I, you know, I like to listen to a lot of different things. And now that I've gotten older, um, I would say that I'm probably not listening to as many different albums but, you know, if I think back over the years, I mean, one killer record that I would recommend for anyone to hit, to check out that I can still put on today and, and listen to it from the beginning to the end, it's Kurt, Curtis Mayfield, Live at the Bitter End. That's a great, he's, he's just amazing, that guy, man. <laughs> you know, so we could, throw, we could throw that one on in, throw that one in there. You, you I know mean, what? I don't think I have that record. I've got... Tons of Curtis Mayfield stuff. I don't think live you know, at the bitter end. Yeah, or I mean, just you know, Aretha Franklin, like a, like a greatest hits. I mean, you know, anything that's like that real soul music. Um, but Curtis was a lot of psychedelic stuff too, man. He was great. I mean, I love his stuff, man. I, I've got about fifteen of his records, man. Yeah, he's such. Yeah, live at the bitter end. I didn't even know yeah. that existed. I have to go. Just because it's the bitter end and because it's Curtis and like the two of them, that's got to be really cool. Yeah. That's not around anymore, is it? The bottom line is, or no, but bitter end's still around. The bottom line, so bottom line is long gone. Yeah, yeah right, right, right. Yeah. There's a lot of shows in those places. Um, best decision you ever made. Oh, that's an easy one. What? Marry my wife. There you go, man. That's another <laughs> thing we have in common. <laughs> yeah. That's an easy one. Yeah, man. And if you can say that that's the best decision, I think that's really special. 
Oh, that's by leaps and bounds mine for sure. I wouldn't have hesitate for a second on that. Yeah. Most important things you've learned about you. Um, well, I guess over the years, especially after, you know, post marriage, you know, it's really being, being able to communicate, you know, and, and, um, and, and to express yourself, you know, better, you know, verbally, you know, and just not keep things in. I mean, you got to talk it through, you know? Um, and I think, I guess maybe it would be that. Is that kind of where? Yeah. Yeah, man. Whatever, whatever floats your boat. That's a great thing, man. That's yeah. an important thing in a relationship for sure, man. Right. I mean, if you want it like, that kind of a relationship. I mean, it's funny. Relationships are different. Like I've, I, you, I've met guys. Oh man, I love my wife. And like, you find out they don't really talk very much. They may not even sleep. In the same. So like relationships are really different for, for everybody. I mean, what yeah. I want and what I'm willing to put up with and what my wife wants and she's maybe like totally irrelevant to somebody else. Right. But I, that's what I want. I want that communication, man. I don't, I mean, I can get a stuffed animal, you know, I don't, you right. know? <laughs> oh, I mean, seriously, you know, right. I, I need somebody to support me and I can support them, you know, Yeah, that's everything, man. Life is not for the weak. You need some help, man. I do anyway, you know, uh, uh, good transition to the next question. What's your definition of happiness, Carl? Um, <sighs> wow. Being with the person that you want to spend the rest of your life with. Oh, dude, you're uh, getting brownie points for this, dude. I, I, you know, I mean, and, and 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 knowing that that's uh, that you don't have another choice. And when I say that, because you can't, there isn't another choice. Because not because there no, for you, be. for you, there's yeah. no. Yeah, right. That's great, man. Yeah. Cool. Man. And, That's powerful when you got that. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I've never, I've always been very grateful for my relationship with my, and we both work at it. It's not like, you know, it's a layup. Um, right. I mean, you have to, I, I mean, you know, um, but other people that haven't had long-term relationships, I don't know if this happens to you, the first thing they often say is, Hey, you don't realize how, uh, how that makes your life that much different. And I don't because I've only known that, you know, right. I'm very grateful for it, but you know, from mm -hmm. hearing with others that it does, you know, what a benefit it is, man. I'm, I'm Absolutely. even more grateful. This is a tough one, man. What do you like most about yourself? <laughs> what do I, what do I like about myself? Uh, that's kind of a funny question. <laughs> it is a funny question. Um, I don't know. I mean, I guess I, I don't, I'm not sure how to answer that. Maybe we're going to put a slide on that one. Okay. Not, <laughs> All good, man. Yeah. What do I like about myself? I don't know. What do you like most? <laughs> um, what do I, you know, I think that would be a good question to ask people that know you. What do they like about you? That's the thing that, cause I'm trying to get my head around that. No, that's irrelevant. Yeah. <laughs> that's not important to the answer of this. Yeah. It's interesting, though. I will slide on that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, most important thing your dad taught you? That he taught me. Um, well, I mean, it, I guess it, it wouldn't be like a verbal teaching, but just, uh, you know, my, my dad was like always kind of very soft-spoken. He kept like really kind of chill so maybe that i i sure i got from him and um uh, and one of the things that i still do to this day from from my memories of him i mean this is going to sound probably kind of funny but the thing is is that i still pop popcorn 
No, that's like, cool, man. Not and not in a microwave. Oh, in like a pot. In a pan. Yeah, in a know? pan. Yeah. You know, and uh, and and that's one of the fun memories I have. You know, when I think back about my, I mean, that's such a simple thing, but you know, um, when I have a bowl of popcorn, I mean, I always think about it because that was just like, you know, popping some popcorn and like going back in the thing and watching Kojak. That was like, you know. <laughs> you know, uh, I, it's funny. I, I was talking to my wife that they, those little simple things yeah, often bring you the greatest n nostalgic memories. I know they do me for sure. So right. I mean, you know, your thing is, you know, me, I was talking about something my wife said or did. Uh, to, a little, you know, you don't need, uh, you don't think about things. Right. I've, I've come to learn. It's interactions or little things that make you feel a certain way, like a certain house or a certain car. Like, for me anyway, I'm never going to say, man, that car made me feel so good. That's like. Right totally irrelevant you know yeah it's it's, it's the popcorn that that says right. oh my, that's special to me how about your mom most important thing she taught you um well i guess my mom she was very different i mean my mom was very uh yeah, um i guess from her she was she could have a tendency to 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 verbally like really lay it on you yeah. so you know and and at a certain point i can i can go there um but with her one of the things that, that i remember the most about her in you know especially when i was a kid was just between her and my dad the two of them was just the wanting to um, you know, bring, you know, in enjoyment for others. My, you know, my mom was, you know, she, she was a homemaker and she was also very into, you know, socializing and cooking. So, you know, I have a lot of memories as a kid of, you know, someone was always coming through our house, you know, to eat or, you know, she's going to serve them a meal or, hey, you know, so-and-so needs a, needs a plate of food here, take this over to their house. You know, I can still hear her telling my dad, you know, hey, take this over to so-and-so because, you know, they need something to eat. And these kind of things, I'm mean, when I think back, you know, uh, about her in the, in the younger years, um, that's something that I'm sure in some way has an, has an influence on me. And, like, there were so many summers where I had younger cousins that my neighbor come to our house. My mom would always take care of them. And, uh, and even now as an adult, you know, I, I have one of my cousins telling me, he says, man, you know why I used to come to your house like all those sorts? Because my dad, because my mom's brother, because my dad would sit me out there so she could straighten me out. <laughs> yeah. A little so, boot camp. Yeah, that, that, that's what it was. You know, it's just that generation, you know, like there's no BS, you know, and, um, but both of my parents were, you know, a big, big supporter in, in, in me playing music and everything so that was that was extremely uh you know beneficial you know as, as a young as a youngster i mean because often we were you know like jamming at my house or whatever and and uh and they were always very supportive my mom was like very proud of me you know just like very now i can when i look back and now it's probably just like show up hey carl come and play the guitar for these people you know but the guests at the house you know yeah so it was like a lot of that too my cousin and that's was, great like at the time yeah that's really cool man very supportive yeah. yeah and you mentioned you're into martial arts any other hobbies or interests um uh you know besides like being like kind of i don't want to say like i'm a like a full-on like a comic book nerd because I'm not like extreme like some of them can get to, but I really enjoy like, you know, sci-fi and superheroes and, you know, kind of things like that. And when I was a kid, I used to draw my own comic books and things. So, uh, yeah, I guess maybe, uh, you know, people that know me might not know that aspect. Um, and that's the other thing that makes it 
very interesting that I'm involved with Teen Titans. Teen so, Titans, that's what know, I was thinking. You know, because like the, you know, my family members that my, you know, that know me from, as, from, you know, back in the day, they're like, man, isn't it crazy? They used to draw all those comic books and all this stuff, and now you're in a cartoon. Yeah, so yeah, it's a lot of it. It brings me some personal, uh, definitely some personal enjoyment to you know to have that that kind of connection because I can still like go down in my basement right now, and my wife's like. Why do you have to have all these boxes down here? Like, why? What are these? I said, I oh, you got old school. You got the boxes with the plastic bags and the I, cardboard. I, I, yeah. Think I don't? Yeah. I. Uh, <laughs> I've got the. I've got a whole collection down there. Yeah, I think the biggest one I have at this point, uh, or oh, the one that remains, is is a series that was happening in the early '90s, and it's like uh, the death of Superman, and now some of that came back in in the Superman movies, and then. Uh, and then the Batman, where he gets his back broken by Bane and all this. So like, I got the, I got all that. Oh, so you're a DC guy. <laughs> yeah, I got, I have all that, and uh, yeah, with the comics, I, I was always into kind of, um, you know, uh, you know, Dark, Dark Knight, and you know, and Superman stuff. Uh, but movie wise, um, definitely a Marvel fan. I mean, that, that, that everything they have going on is totally rocking. I mean, and and to see that transition like from when we were younger when Lou Ferrigno used to be the Hulk you know it, yeah and, and that was like incredible as it was at that time and now when you turn on the screen now it's even like oh it's phenomenal man I mean just you know with the digital technology and everything you really believe that you're there well like when they're destroying a whole city it's like wow <laughs> you know they're super it's really cool it's really yeah. cool yeah, it, it really is. You know, so yeah, between those things and you know, and, and and coming up with Star Trek and all that, yeah. So I guess sci-fi and and uh, and, and Marvel. I got a call in there. there yeah, go. like so you know, sci-fi and Marvel. You know, you know, my god brother and I. I you know, he's he he's he's in your neck of the woods. He's down in Miami and like still he like calls me some one time and he goes. He says, man, you know, still, you know, if a movie has a spaceship in it, it's probably going to be a good movie. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool, man. That's funny. Hey, man, three more questions. Uh, tell me about a specific experience that changed your life or changed the way you think about things. Oh, man, we already know the answer to that one. Get married? <laughs> <laughs> but no, but to 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 the person that you know is is the one that and and it, and it's and it's working. This your first? Yeah. Oh wow, that's impressive. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. That's cool, that was man. an easy. That was an easy one. Anything you wish you did different, or anything you regret not doing? Okay, I'm going to relate that to a Star Trek episode. There you go. Only <laughs> you have to dress up like Captain Kirk. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's and it's a later Star Trek. It's the Star Trek with Jean Luc Picard as the captain. And and that was the scenario. I don't know if you're a Trek fan, but those of you out there that are listening, not that far up, but go ahead. You know, they're going to remember this episode where they. I'm trying to remember that character. I'm trying, uh, but it was a character that could really manipulate time and create alternate realities and blah blah blah. So anyway. Uh, Jean Luc Picard, who was the captain of, of, of the Enterprise in this at this stage of the game, this is the next generation, had a similar. The question was posed to him, like something like, you know, what would you want to change, kind of a thing. For it was a very, and he goes, well, you know, back when I was in Starfleet, I wish I hadn't punched this guy or some. I mean, something very random. Yeah. And he, and, he, and the guy's like, okay, make it so. And then guess what happened? He mm -hmm. transformed from the captain of the ship to being the lowest member of the Star Crew, right. of the Starfleet. And, and then he said, that one punch or whatever it was, he did that change the whole course of your character and like you standing up for yourself. And even though now when you look back at it, you think, well, I wish I had done that. But that's what shaped your whole... Yeah, so in other words, in order to answer your question, I think what we should say is that you don't change anything. Yeah. Because, you know, what is that called? With the butterfly effect, right? Because you don't know 
where you might think, well, I wish I hadn't done that, but how would that truly affect you in, in your current state? Because yeah. all those events are what brings you to the point, you know, that you're at. So I guess you don't change anything. I hear you. Do you ever see this movie? It's a chick flick called Sliding Doors. You know, I have seen that. And now that you mentioned that, I probably need to watch that again. That because that's kind of the premise of it, right? It's a, a whole thing. She like gets delayed going down a stairway in the uh, subway, and her whole right. life has changed. She misses the train. Right. Her whole life has changed, man. Yeah. So that's why I like. It's. It, I'm not a guy to watch chick flicks, but I like that one because it ta- it was really interesting, like that. You know, I mean, so I, yeah, I guess you can't really change things, but you know, you can certainly look and like, wow, I wish maybe this or that or. But just don't go there. Uh, well, plus you don't. You wish this, but that might have caused something else terrible to happen, and you just don't know. Yeah, I, I'm a I'm a believer of that, man. Right. Last question, uh, and I and thank you for your time. I really appreciate it, man. This been this been a lot of fun. I really, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah. No, man, it's my pleasure. Likewise. Uh, biggest change in your personality over the last ten years, and how much of that change has been intentional, and how much is just a natural product uh, or byproduct of aging? Goodness gracious, yeah. Um, Goodness gracious. That, man, that's the same answer once again, Craig. Your personality hasn't changed? No. Oh, your wife? Yeah, because then you have to, there's, uh, that's, you know, that's, I, I, it has to be that. You know, and, 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 it, and, and, it, and it goes along with just, you know, I'm not, you know, trying to be a better trying to be a better communicator right um so i guess were you not good at communicating when you were younger were you quiet or it's like very quiet you know i'm just not really saying much or um uh, yeah so I, i think that's different and that i could imagine that's probably something that she would say as well um i think that's probably the biggest change over that time and then you know with having a family and kids and then you know having that responsibility that there's other people that are um you know that that are that are counting on you you know besides you you just being out there as your own self oh yeah are you shy by nature am i shy i'm i don't think no, shy would definitely not be the word. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, I'm not, I wouldn't say that I'm shy. I'm not, not very, uh, I'm not very proactive when it comes, like if I'm in a group setting, that I'm not, that's not really what I'm good at. That's something that probably could be better. You know, You'd like be the guy group, laying back. Yeah, like when you're a group of people and you don't know everyone and just like you have to hit the scene and just be like, and it, you know, that's, not, that's not really me. I mean, some people have a gift for that, yeah. You know, but that that I don't have. And and in our business and the entertainment and everything, and I, well, I guess in any profession, having that skill of communicating, that's that's another gift that some people do have. I call it, you know just the gift of talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you're you you have a marketing background, so you know what I mean, <laughs> right? But you know what I'm. Yeah, you know, yeah. It's a yeah. It's it's. Yeah, you, know, you got to sell yourself. That's not me. That's not me. That's not any musician, with rare exception that I've met. Man, I mean, it's you guys, you guys, I say this in jest. It's true. I say it in jest, but with with no malice. You guys are allergic to it, actually. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing. Like, I'll have guys on the show. Yeah. And like I did with you, I, let, I, I want to support you as we're going to do in a second. I'll tell people what you got going on. And they're like, nah, you don't need to say anything. And I'll be like, hey, man, didn't you just drop a record? Oh, I guess so. And I'm like, man, this shit ain't going to – it's not going to fly into people's ears. Right. I mean, would you like to maybe have someone listen to it, you know? And right. like, oh, I guess so. So it's like almost like an allergy with, with – it's just I think it's a different part of the brain that, you know – some creatives just don't access or can't or don't want to. Right. 
you know, so, and it's, uh, it's unfortunate, but especially today more than ever now you, you, you need to, you know, it's not like you got the labels pushing anything, you know, right. it's, it's, uh, you know, you got to promote and I'm happy to support it. So, Hey, that's what I'm here Thanks. for. Um, Listen, a couple of things. First of all, thank you, man. I'm really glad we got to connect. We'll definitely like to see you next time you come down here. I want to tell people what you got going on. First of all, uh, we mentioned it. Okay, let me just get the socials first. You could uh, follow Carl on social media on Instagram. It's Carl Burnett, B-U-R-N-E-T-T. And his Instagram ID is FunkyMofo, F-U-N-K-E, the letter E, Mofo, as in whatever. Uh, (laughs) um, Okay. Private lessons. He does a. He's a really good teacher. Um, if you are, do you want to like to do what certain student you're looking for or not looking for? You know, I would say any anyone who's interested in in unlocking and or the the potential of when I was talking about playing in a groove, that would be you know, I would be your guy for that. Um, you know, I mean, if you want to talk about, you know, how, what, you know, what kind of scales you're going to be playing over. I mean, I, I, I will do that to some extent, but when you're playing, it's got to be about playing with others and playing songs and knowing uh, and, and strengthening your, you know, yourself as, as part of the rhythm section, you know, just like when, when we talked about, you know, with, with Bill, you know, early, early on, because for me, I think, from what I've seen just when I, in that I'm doing some more private lessons recently is just the stressing of keeping time, keeping time, man. Yeah. And, and I'm, just, I'm sorry, all man. About, yeah, I'm all about that. And just for those of you, uh, this guy's a Berkeley grad, so it's not like he doesn't know scales or anything like that, but oh, you absolutely. know, if, um, but if you're really interested in, in firming up your rhythm playing and keeping time, he is the man to work with. And if you want to do that, uh, either message him on Instagram or go to carlburnett.com. And uh, I think his email address is there. And also there's a contact tab. You can Absolutely. Do that. And give him a little background, like, you know, how long you've been playing, what are you looking to accomplish and stuff like that. So he has a frame of reference when he responds to you. Yeah. Um, also, uh, Carl does a lot of mobile tracks and production. So if you're interested in having him work on some mobile tracks for you or maybe help you with production of a project you've got going on, same thing. Go to uh, message him. Well, Instagram is probably not going to be a ton of room, but message him on social media or go to uh, carlburnett.com. Again, it's B-U-R-N-E-T-T, Carl with a C, and uh, email him and just tell him what you're looking for. And uh, True Fire, you got a lot of stuff going on there, why don't you? And I have one of Carl's uh, classes on uh, funk shit. It's uh, awesome. And he's got oh, a guitar. That's great. No, man, I, I think I said, the first thing I told you, I said, man, I, I got one of your classes. It's really good. In fact, yeah. I had to uh, do like a little funk thing for somebody, and I watched that to just like get some confidence. Right. It well, thanks. Great. Thanks, Craig. I mean, the, the first lesson – it's called the Funk Guitar Survival Guide. That's it, and, yeah. And I, and I started with that lesson because it was the lesson that was given to me when I was a teenager. And, and what it was is this, and I'll share this with the listeners. So I'm, I had a new, new guitar teacher that I got, had gotten referred to, and the first thing he said to me was, okay, play me something, which I did. And then he said, Play me the exact same thing, but this time, pat your foot. Nice. I was dead in the water. Keep in time. And he goes, I want you to go and practice with a metronome. And then he wrote out this exercise of subdividing 16th notes. That's and what that's you taught. Important. That's what you and taught. That's very, and I said, that's the most important lesson as, you know, as a lesson, music lesson that I ever got that was beyond what kind of chords you know, what kind of chord scales you know. All it was was about keeping time, learning how to, to feel the reference of where the rhythms are in reference to the beat. And, uh, and I carried that lesson with me. Uh, this goes another sh- uh, shameless plug. At one point, I was teaching a class at MI. <laughs> there you go. When was this, when you were oh. living in? Yeah, it was in LA. It was called uh, Funk Pro Series. This was the and uh, 
and that was, and I brought that lesson with me to MI and I wrote it up on the whiteboard. And this class, uh, it was an ensemble class. So each week the students had a, a, a specific song that they were supposed to learn to play with the rhythm section. So I had a private counseling where I had a group of, uh, group of students where we would be working on whatever those songs were that were part of the curriculum. But what I was finding was, you know, we need to go one step back because how are you going to play a, a Prince song if you can't keep time and don't know where the beat is? It's just impossible. So I wrote out this exercise and then one of the students goes, man, we have, that's really simple, man. Can't you just show us how to play the Prince song? <laughs> and I'm like, okay, come up and play the exercise for everybody. That was the end of that conversation. Interesting. That was a great way to open up that, that, uh, lesson man well I, I got i got a lot out of that i really did thanks well it just it gave me fundamentals basic confidence and and understanding of you know what's the first thing i need to do right you know which was obviously super important so thank you well man um and where do, where do you post all your true fire stuff or what's going on um the the true fire courses uh, all those those links are, are on my website great and if, and if one would like to support uh, the the you know the educational uh, you know my educational you know path that I'm on if you if you order the things off of my website yeah order them off Carl's website because he gets a better cut man yeah so that, do that I would appreciate that, if you did that man support my guests yeah, that that you know and that goes for all the you know for all the true fire artists you know if you if you if you get hip to anyone who's working on the True Fire platform, uh, it it's going to benefit the the artists that you're into if you go through their channel and order those courses. I mean, and even anybody at True Fire is going to tell you, you know, that, you know they they stress that, you know, because uh, that that you know that helps the the the, the educators uh, in, in a big way when uh when their when their educational work is supported you know off of their platforms you know and, yeah and it just a tell of it, it's the same exact class the same yeah. exact delivery from true fire it's just right. the initial link where that comes from so yes, yes. support everybody that's on this show by please doing that so go yeah. to carburnett.com and check out his class if you're interested in learning some funk stuff i highly recommend that class thanks great thanks that's good man and, no, I'm happy, any, and i'm happy to share it i've become much more sensitive sensitive to it in in recent years, just because yeah, of, of the amount of unfunkiness that I've witnessed. <laughs> on, on yeah, there's the not much funk on YouTube. You don't see new guitar players playing funk. You know, you know it's, if it's not 160 beats per minute, it's not going on YouTube. It's yeah, nice. I mean, I'm not knocking anyone that, that's no. doing that, but I just, I, I have a different take on it. I'll say that. I'll tell you, my, my younger son, he's 27, he sent me this text message the other day. It was quite funny. Um, he said, because uh, he's always trying to get, he said, uh, I checked out this song called Let's Ride by the OJs. I like it a lot. And I also like Backstabbers, Love Train, and some other good songs. And I said, yeah, man, all that. 70s funk is where it's at man yeah. he's on a good path he's on a good path i know i know <laughs> hey listen brother i really appreciate your time any final words of wisdom or uh or or sci-fi that you want to put out there <laughs> <laughs> i know i'm kind of intrigued about the new series on the disney network i mean you know there's so much on online you know on the internet now. I mean, now I was saying, man, do I want to like get deep and like go into Star Wars, like the Mandalorian? I don't know if I'm going to go there. But what I will leave anyone with, I mean, since we're, since the show is about guitar, is to, you know, as much as everybody loves a blazing guitar solo, don't overlook the importance of being able to play within the rhythm section because that's what you're going to be doing the most of the time to you know, strengthen your copying and, and your accompaniment, you know, and, and playing with others and it, whether you're playing, even if you're just accompanying yourself as a, as a singer or, or another vocalist, you know, that's, you have to, you have to be able to do that. Absolutely, man. Well spoken. You don't have to be able to play a blazing Steve Vai guitar solo. 
Yeah. Nor should or you aim for that. The, or whoever the, your favorite, you know, guitar hero happens to be. That you don't have to be able to do. But if you want to work, you have to be able to keep time and, and there, play in the rhythm section. There you go. If you want to work, that's you just said it, man. You know. If you want to work. Right. <laughs> Carl, thank you for everything, man. Hang on, let me just wrap this up. And thanks yes. for your time, and I had a good time. Thank with you. you. I had a blast. Thanks. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this show, please share it on your social media networks with your friends. We appreciate your support. Please go to carlburnett.com, support whatever Carl's doing. Uh, check out his True Fire courses. He's available for mobile, mobile tracks and production. His Instagram is funk, F-U-N-K-E, mofo. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in private lessons, go to his website and hit him up from there or from social media. Um, that's it. Most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play, right? Be nice, <laughs> go play your guitar, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. Thank All you. Right, peace.